on the eve of the millennium, as some Americans party like it's 1999. Others believe the end of the 90s marks a countdown to the end of the world. Y2K well, is like a perfect scenario for the collapse of society. For many, the fears from a computer glitch long ignored. It could happen that planes fall out of the sky. Could the omission of two simple digits affect the destiny of all humankind? But for others, it's called the militia. And by God, no constable's going to break their door now. They'll shoot them first. Y2K is another government plot to steal their freedom. This is the biggest lie that's ever been put before the American public. It all spreads panic and paranoia. Countdown to Y2K begins. Gentlemen, cough your bunkers. Until everyone wonders, is this a podcast now? This is not one of the summer movies where you can close your eyes during the scary parts. family to the top of this mountain nine years ago because he wanted to be left alone. Now a force of 200 police, federal agents, and the National Guard have surrounded the house. Early in the 1990s, the ATF and other federal officers attempt to execute a warrant on anti-government survivalist Randy Weaver over an outstanding weapons charge. It leads to an 11-day standoff in Ruby Ridge, Idaho. Weaver is wanted on charges of selling two illegal sawed-off shotguns to a federal informer. When the smoke clears, Weaver's wife, their 14-year-old son, and the U.S. Marshal are dead, leaving anti-government anger simmering among his supporters. Weaver's charged with murder, conspiracy, and some lesser crimes, but because the FBI and ATF failed to identify themselves as law enforcement, Celebrity defense lawyer Gary Spence successfully argues self-defense. We have to stick with our rights, and we have to fight for them. And if we fight for them, people can hear us. The verdict legitimizes the anti-government hate at the core of a growing movement of militant extremists across the country. It was very easy for right-wing extremists to imagine that the federal government was, was willing to go after anybody that it disagreed with and use lethal force in doing that. And soon that fear and paranoia will morph a legitimate worldwide technological crisis is Y2K. A computer anomaly experts say could unleash global Armageddon. They had proclaimed the world's going to end tomorrow. You know, this was uh, doomsday. People worried about technical failures. My name is Francine Wayne Numa. I'm a freelance writer. And I wrote a piece for Time.com about the 20-year anniversary of Y2K. There was a lot of fears about power grids, our broader sort of infrastructure. And nuclear power plants may cease to generate the electricity we need. It's the kind of tricky international problem most people looked at government to solve. But in the 90s, America's burgeoning militia movement sees a trap and is arming itself in preparation of a government clampdown. The far right was on their guard. But Y2K didn't have to be a crisis at all. Because this Canadian had been warning everyone about this moment for 20 years. Before Y2K, I was a nobody. I was a computer operator. I fed paper into an IBM printer. And then in 1979, I noticed the problem. I'm Peter Diager, and I'm not only the Paul Revere of Y2K, I was also the gloom and doomster. Back in the 1960s, 1970s, and the beginning of the day, when you started up a computer, so there was no place for the computer to get the date and the time, because the internet didn't exist. So you had to enter it in. Tell me what the, the year is. And you type in two digits, seven, nine. All these programs were written, you know, in the 50s or 60s. And data was expensive. And so they shortened the year to two digits. Now, I just come out of university studying numerical analysis. And I figured that, well, something is going to go wrong on January the 1st, year 2000. Because we're going to enter zero, zero. 
and the computer is going to think it's 1900. It's Peter's light bulb moment. The computer's confusion over what year it is could lead to cataclysmic consequences. I started to try and make people aware of it. My boss. He said, you're worried about a problem that isn't going to happen for 21 years. Get out of my office. Someone will fix it by then. Peter's boss was misguided because even as he said, someone will fix it, those someones had been ignoring the two-digit date problem for decades. The Scottish bank, uh, Widow's Bank, ran into a problem when they're entering in 30-year mortgages. The closing date of the mortgage is in the year 2000. The computer didn't take kindly to that. Still, the standard phrase was, someone else will fix this by then. Of course, no one does. And as the world begins to explore cyberspace, the issue becomes even more urgent. In 1989, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, uh, he's a British scientist, he invented the World Wide Web, and that set the stage for the 90s. I'm Steve Morgan, founder of Cybersecurity Ventures and editor-in-chief at Cybercrime Magazine. So we entered the 90s, and it's a whole new world. Uh, it's an online world. Everybody was, was living differently. In the early 1990s, our personal computers, the high-end ones, had 640K of memory. High-density storage was 360K on a large floppy drive. I mean, this was the stone age of computer time. And as 90s PC makers try to change that, featuring the SLC processor, the fastest in its class, by enthusiastically introducing faster models with even more memory, the PS2 SLC. Peter's becoming increasingly passionate about repairing the looming Y2K bug. The truth of the matter is, Y2K offended me. It was a stupid, silly problem. And no one is paying attention. Peter's compelled to go public with his concerns. Back in 1993, I wrote the article that kicked all of this off. Doomsday 2000. But it wasn't my first article on Y2K. I'd written another one called TikTok, TikTok, Times Are Wasting. Well, that got no attention at all. Except from one or two journalists who said, ha ha, little programmer, you know, is trying to scare the world. Isn't this funny? Ha ha ha. Computer World at the time was the magazine for the IT industry, out to more than 300,000 people in the U.S. every single week. Peter's Doomsday 2000 article finally grabs the attention of the computer community. Someone would ask, well, how bad could it be, Peter? And the honest answer of that is pretty bad. It could happen that planes fall out of the sky, elevators go into the ground, uh, pharmaceutical companies have expiry problems, inventory control problems, ATM machines, all computer systems, especially financial systems, wherever you had a computer controlling something. It means every bank, institution, corporation, and government in the world could suffer massive operational failures at the turn of the century. But while some insiders are listening, convincing organizations to take action against the Millennium Bug is nearly impossible. In the early 1990s, people at the top really didn't understand how much they depended upon their computer systems. And then along come people like myself, and we have to have this fixed by the year 2000. And oh, by the way, it's going to cost a truckload of money. They're going to be very, very reluctant to believe you. But Peter's underlying message of impending doom and gloom does find receptive audience and America's rising right-wing militia groups who increasingly believe they're at war with the government over their freedoms. Eight months after the standoff with Randy Weaver at Ruby Ridge, a compound outside Waco, Texas explodes with bloodshed, igniting even more anti-government sentiment. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms launched a raid on the compound of a small religious sect called the Branch Davidians who have a sort of an apocalyptic mindset. 
ATF had information that they had illegal weapons, which they did. Let me tell you what they're doing. Ceasefire, they're ceasefire. They want to move their injured troops out of there. Four agents are killed. A number of Davidians are killed or wounded. This precipitates a 51-day standoff. Um, I'm Mark Pitkovich, and I'm a senior research fellow with the Anti-Defamation League Center on Extremism. The FBI comes in and takes over, and they basically try to force an end to the standoff, which goes horribly awry. The Davidians start setting fires on the compound. A large numbers of them are burned to death. Along with their leader, David Koresh, 76 brand Davidians die in the siege. America was shocked. Both the ATF and the FBI come under considerable criticism. But especially, it agitated the far right. In Ruby Ridge, Idaho in 1992 and Waco, Texas in 1993, federal agents killed multiple people, including children. Both those incidents really riled up the extreme right and, in fact, helped generate a whole new extremist movement in the United States, the militia movement. And soon, followers of America's militia movement will commit previously unthinkable acts to further their anti-government agenda. That was a big wake-up call to people in the United States. In the mid-90s, Peter DeYager and a group of computer programmers are attempting and failing to save the world's computers from the millennium bug. As I continued to beat the drum, I became known as the Paul Revere of Y2K, or the doomsayer, or the fear monger, or however you want to phrase it. I was that guy. That was difficult and that was frustrating. While Peter and others struggle to be heard, Another more sinister group with their own end-of-the-world concerns is making its mark. Sparked by anti-government standoffs at both Ruby Ridge and Waco, America's militia movement is expanding. The first militia group emerges beginning in 94 with the militia of Montana, and numerous other groups start popping up all around the country within the next few months. The militia movement believed that the rest of the world uh, was essentially controlled by a global, tyrannical, socialist, one-world government. They call it the New World Order. They believe our own government was actually collaborating with the New World Order to slowly strip us of our rights and freedoms, starting with our right to keep and bear arms. Because once we're rendered defenseless, we too will be absorbed, essentially as slaves, into the New World Order. And that is what Americans have to fight against. The militia movement's fear of a new world order becomes a rallying cry for many right-wing Americans. God bless America and death to the new world order! Yeah. Their distrust is fueled by Bill Clinton, who signs the federal assault weapons ban into law in 1994, providing more ammunition for the militia movement's rage. The people of the United States must keep their arms. It's the only way to stop tyranny. It grew remarkably rapidly and spread across the whole country, and it brought in a bunch of new blood to the far right, a bunch of newly radicalized people. I felt like the Lord is saying, this is the army of the Lord in the United States for this moment. The members see themselves as patriots. Like the American revolutionaries in the 1770s who took up arms against the tyrannical British, modern Americans would have to take up arms against their own government and against the New World Order. As PCs connect people in cyberspace, militia organizers use online bulletin board systems and chat rooms to recruit new members. Meanwhile, Canadian Peter DeYager, working out of his basement in Brampton, Ontario, uses the same resources to warn the world about a problem that's about to earn its catchy name. The term Y2K came out of a shorthand used in a chat room. Y2K sort of has this ring to it of, you know, nothing else. Despite its easy-to-remember name, convincing folks to spend time and money to fix Y2K is a hard sell. People are reluctant to listen to bad news. They go, is it working now? Yes. Is it fine? Yes. Then don't waste any money on that. We have other stuff to do. While Peter agonizes over the government doing too little, 
The 90s militia movement continues to sign up members by arguing the government is doing too much. The movement grows to an estimated 60,000 members nationwide. Aided by anti-government propaganda, passed around at gun shows, including the infamous videotape Waco, The Big Lie. Produced by attorney Linda Thompson, the documentary helps sow the seeds of a catastrophe in the mind of a young Gulf War veteran. On property they called the Mount Carmel Center. Tim McVeigh was um, an anti-government extremist, but what triggered him was the standoff at Waco. He actually drove his pickup truck to the side of the standoff to give away or sell extremist bumper stickers and other paraphernalia. And after the end of the standoff, he obsesses over Waco conspiracy theories, and in particular the conspiracy videotape on Waco by Linda Thompson, who became one of the pioneers of the militia movement. The ATF has... Thompson claimed the big lie that the Branch Davidians didn't start the fire that killed 76 people. It was a false flag operation where government agents framed the members of the apocalyptic cult. Now they're finishing off the job right now. They're destroying the crime scene. America, this is the biggest lie that's ever been put before the American public, ever. And Timothy McVeigh watched it over and over again and, you know, became outraged um, at the federal government and, you know, eventually got the idea that he wanted to attack it. And on the second anniversary of what extremists call the Waco Massacre. Here, tanks methodically push what remains of the house and evidence into the fire. The Timothy fire... McVeigh, along with Army buddy Terry Nichols, execute their monstrous plan. The Oklahoma City bombing, which happened on April 19th, 1995, was a huge fertilizer bomb in a truck. Timothy McVeigh drives it to the Muro Federal Building and sets it off. <laughs> It becomes the worst act of domestic terrorism in the United States history and the second worst act of terrorism period in our country's history, second only to the 9-11 attacks. The bombing in Oklahoma City was an attack on innocent children and defenseless citizens. The Oklahoma City bombing kills 168 innocent people, including 19 children. Oklahoma City was hard for us to process. You're looking shocked the whole country and you know the images of firefighters cradling the bodies of bloody infants you know that they had taken out of the rubble had a, just a tremendous effect on everybody but not everyone responds in the same way despite the carnage being aired on live tv right-wing extremists believe mcveigh is a patsy taking the fall in another big lie they credit the government with the attack and accuse the media of engineering cover-up all of it to convince Americans that go along with the new world order. They killed 86 people in Waco. I don't see why they'd have a problem with killing 168 more. In the summer of 1995, just a couple months after the Oklahoma City bombing, I actually created a website about right-wing extremism. And this was at a time when the World Wide Web was so tiny that I literally could and did look at every mention of the word militia on the entire internet. When these groups started popping up and claiming to be descended from the original historical legitimate militia. The historian in me was like, what? That's totally bogus. When the U.S. Justice Department creates an anti-domestic terrorism program, they hire Mark Pitkavich, who quickly identifies a new possible trigger for right-wing extremist attacks. Y2K. For anti-government extremists who think that the United States government is collaborating with the New World Order to take over, UK is like a perfect scenario for that. There could be, you know, significant collapse of society, and the government would use that as an excuse to do everything on its nefarious agenda. Militia members look for any opportunity to spread their message, including a surprising appearance on Donahue before millions of Americans. You think that the feds are coming, they're going to suspend the Constitution, they're going to take your guns away. The government comes to my gun, I'm simply going to let them have it. You pull the trigger on a federal agent coming up to your place? I will. A man home is his castle. If I have to die proving that, so be it. Concerned that confusion over Y2K will be the catalyst for more extremist violence, Congress calls a hearing to lay out the facts and invites the Paul Revere of Y2K, Peter DeYager. I was a nobody, uh, you know, Y2K person without portfolio. And then finally, governments were get, beginning to wake up. And I testified before the U.S. I testified in uh, Australia. I did some work 
Tony Blair and them over the UK. As international governments wake up to the perils of Y2K, so do media outlets around the world. Government is not a little behind, but way behind. Tremendously behind. The wake-up call is now. With pressure mounting on the U.S. government, the need arises for someone to lead the bureaucratic charge for Y2K. The question is who? Having spent 20 years crises, so one night, the president called. So we talked for about 10 or 15 minutes. So the next night, the vice president, Al Gore, called me. And I said, you know, if you get the Pope to call me tomorrow night, I might take this job. I'm John Koskinen. I was chair of the President's Council on Year 2000 Conversion, uh, responsible for coordinating uh, the federal government's role in ultimately 170 countries around the world. So needless to say, I signed up to take on the responsibility for Y2K. But is it too little, too late? With only two years until the year 2000, people fear Koskinen won't be able to avert disaster. We went from, this is silly, this is nonsense, to, oh my God, we're not going to have enough time to fix it. There he is. These things that you're talking about, you did them to Jerry. Jerry is very dangerous. By 1998, even as Hollywood turns right-wing conspiracy theories into a movie storyline, far-right talk radio hosts are claiming Y2K is a legitimate government plot. You're the children, and the government's your mommy and daddy, big brother. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something right now. They're gonna do this. Y2K has a very significant impact on the far-right in the United States in the late 1990s. You had so many people who truly believed that these events were connected and part of something larger and more nefarious. I remember in the 90s driving around and seeing, you know, the bumper stickers on the I love my country, but I fear my government. But behind the scenes, despite the potentially huge cause of failure and his exceptionally late start, John Koskinen's work as the new man in charge of Y2K is much more mundane than nefarious. The president gave me the job and an office and said, don't let the world stop. So I show up in uh, the old executive office building and I flip on the light switch and it occurred to me what happens on January 1st, 2000 if you flip the switch and there's no power. Stoplights don't work, phones don't work, uh, you know, criminals can run wild. So the art form was to get everybody who had a system worried enough to pay attention to it without panicking everybody who depended on those systems. Ultimately, Koskinen has to get tens of thousands of organizations to fix their systems by changing two-digit dates to four-digit dates and millions of lines of computer code. Social Security had 52 million lines of code. So there were thoughtful people who thought, you're never going to get it done. It's impossible. With the Y2K clock counting down, Peter Diager steps up his speaking engagements to help spread the word. The vibe was John the Baptist, a cartoonist for one of the newspapers over in the UK, drew a caricature of me in robes. You know, I just always had clocks on them. When he's not on the road, Peter's focused on his burgeoning website traffic. We had an online mailing list, and at one point we had 80,000 subscribers. We see a four or 500 emails to the mail list every single day. But this was me working out of my, my office in the basement, uh, organizing this global communications network. Peter also teams up with John Koskinen to coordinate their efforts. One of my strategies was to talk to people to see what they knew. Peter Dieger was, to his great credit, one of the early warners about the risk of Y2K. We would keep in regular communications, which was key. John Koskinen approached it from an organizational issue. We started at programmer level and raised the threat of lawyers getting involved so that directors would open up the purse strings and get this done. But the downside to successful Y2K messaging is how easily those messages get distorted in the new 90s internet age. When you create enough noise and the media gets on, the more and more experts are warning that the year 2000 could bring a date with disaster. Then. People who know nothing about the problem, all they hear is this fear-mongering that's going on. And there was a tremendous amount of it. There won't be any elections in the year 2000. There will be a declaration of martial law. You must teach your children now to use a weapon and use it well. Many people in the far right 
become convinced that Y2K hood caused the collapse of society. So, for example, for white supremacists, they are concerned about society collapsing. And all the non-whites coming out of the cities and to the countryside, and that this could start a race war. The far right's fear of a collapse of society helps revive survivalism across America. We have about a year's supply of food here for Y2K. You have to stockpile food, weapons, survival goods, and gear. If it's a case of my family or some other one, then I'm going to opt for protecting my family. And as you get closer to the end of the decade, there are a lot of survival expos more explicitly call themselves like Y2K survival expos. As these events flourish, they give militia groups the opportunity to meet in the real world and exchange their incendiary government beliefs. It becomes one of the core beliefs of the militia movement in the 1990s that there are actually 600 to 800 concentration camps already built in the United States. Fully manned, but empty, but ready for people to be rounded up when Y2K occurs and the government steps in to do all of its nefarious things. Facilities that they think have been turned into a concentration camp or are scheduled to be turned into a concentration camp. The militia movement's suspicion triggers a deadly plan in Texas. A militia cell with members from a variety of different states plotted to attack US military bases that they thought were housing New World Order foreign soldiers and settled upon Fort Hood in Texas that they wanted to attack on the 4th of July. And if it weren't for some undercover officers from the Missouri State Highway Patrol, they might have been successful. Instead, the FBI arrests Kansas militia leader Bradley Glover and accomplice Michael Dorsett in a Texas campground with a lethal cache of weapons. Late 90s America, with the specter of Y2K looming, extremist threats of all kinds are increasing. 1999 arrives with a cacophony of doomsday predictions about the end times. The doomsday preppers started to get involved. They're basically saying, we're all going to die. Our island in space. Our civilization. As the one-year countdown to the millennium begins, Leonard Nimoy goes where no one has gone before, delivering the Y2K family survival guide. How could the omission of two simple digits affect the destiny of all humankind? The new year ushers in a heightened level of anxiety from the spiritual realm. I believe that Y2K may be God's instrument to shake this nation, humble this nation, start revival that spreads the face of the earth before the rapture of the church. Some fringe religious groups become convinced that the end of the world is near or some other cataclysmic event is coming soon. One such apocalyptic cult is Colorado's Concerned Christians, led by Monty Kim Miller, a former pharmaceutical executive. America is Satan's kingdom, counterfeiting the true earthly kingdom of God to come from Israel. Miller believes the U.S. president and the Antichrist are one and the same, and that Y2K will bring the second coming of Christ. He even moves his concerned Christians to Jerusalem to prepare for it. On what form did, did God speak to you about this? He speaks through my mouth. Just months later, on January 3rd, 1999, Police in Israel arrest and deport Miller and 13 other cult members. Police suspect they plan to carry out violent acts to bring about an apocalypse in the year 2000. While America's doomsday cults are stirring up trouble abroad, on U.S. soil, survivalism is on the rise. The number of patriots for profits really were huge. People trying to make a buck by selling you a year's supply of dried beans, by selling you 40,000 rounds of ammunition, they would have like these, except you're supposed to live in them, you know, buried underground, fill it full of supplies and stuff. And we got a sale this Sunday, you know, uh, conveniently just for you. Call now and order your ultimate Y2K survival kit. Y2K survivalist goods are in high demand across America. John Koskin and Ann Peter de Yager are forced to do damage control to stay off the public panic that could cause desperate runs on the nation's supply chain. Are you really confident that you were all ready? We're confident that the basic infrastructure of the United States is going to function effectively. I did more than 2,000 media interviews. Everywhere where there's a computer program, you are affected. The noise level got very, very high. I remember one conference where the speaker in front of me was actually telling the audience that nuclear weapons were going to launch. That there's a nuclear holocaust 
that you happen. I got up and said, the speaker you just heard, that's absolute BS. It's nonsense. But end of the world paranoia is reaching a fever pitch in mainstream media. 100 day countdown to Y2K begins. Gentlemen, cock your bunkers. To prevent an international crisis, Koskinen organizes an emergency meeting of the United Nations. We had 170 countries gathered at the United Nations, which was the largest meeting in history other than the General Assembly meeting at the UN. But despite Koskinen's best efforts, anxiety and doom continue to spread. People thought that this was going to be a disaster for everybody. What if they're right, my God? The survival of millions hangs in the balance. Y2K, the movie. In November 99, an internal FBI report detailing the threats of Y2K domestic terrorism is leaked to the public. We did have a concern of terrorist groups who would try to take advantage of any chaos that happened, because you're going to have huge crowds. One of my concerns also was people hacking into systems. Towards the end of 1999, there's inside information about the hackers of the world putting together a Y2K virus that will strike at midnight. There are also threats to disrupt or destroy some of the nation's critical infrastructure. In the days leading up to the millennium, the feds move against the far-right extremists they consider most dangerous. There were members of a militia cell in California arrested plotting to blow up energy-related facilities, and a militia leader in Florida who were plotting to attack a nuclear power plant. Border police in Washington state also catch a fugitive, Ahmed Rassam, sneaking in from Canada with 130 pounds of explosives in his car. His plan? To detonate a suitcase bomb at LAX on New Year's Day 2000. Despite his arrest, U.S. authorities are forced to wonder how many more terrorists are sign finally arrives. At 8 a.m. in Washington, D.C., Auckland, New Zealand will be the first city to meet the year 2000. John Koskinen is anxiously watching from the Y2K command post two blocks from the White House. We've got a control center, and then we have a couple hundred workstations. We've got Mexico and Canada. We've got all the federal agencies, some industry groups. Seven, And so as we started monitoring New Zealand, we're watching the world turn and you can see these celebrations. And nobody's, you know, dying or nothing's blowing up. While we are encouraged uh, by the positive reports thus far, uh, we should all remember uh, that we have uh, many miles to go before we sleep. With half the world still in 1999, Koskinen has devised a special way to demonstrate his confidence in America's Y2K preparations. People were saying, hey, you know, planes are going to drop out of the sky. So at 6.30 p.m., Koskinen boards a commuter flight from Washington to New York so he can be in the air for London's New Year's celebration at midnight Greenwich Mean Time. I needed to demonstrate we were confident at 7 o'clock we were going to be okay. While Mark Pitcavage is attending a New Year's house party, He's also on standby for ABC News, so he can respond in case there's a terrorist attack. And I said, you know, look, if if all the computers do collapse, I'm not sure you're really going to be able to air your program. But if something happens, an extremist do something, I'm going to be at a friend's house celebrating New Year's Eve. Here's their number. So I'm on the plane. Virtually nobody's flying. To 13 people and five of whom are reporters. And a young reporter from the New York Times <clears throat> says, the guy in the tux in the first row is now very nervous because he didn't realize he was flying to New York during the transition period of Y2K. When the new millennium arrives in London without incident, it marks another Y2K milestone. But America still waits its arrival. Not even the hosts of Late Night are joking about the potential dangers. This terrorism thing is kind of frightening. No one knows. Right. Well, one of them is... Top 10 effects of Y2K. Here we go. Number 10. Stuff's gonna explode. With the millennium just seconds away, the countdown in Times Square begins. Are you ready? Of course, everybody's counting off. You know, it's not often you get the count countdown to a new millennium, right? In 10, 9, 8, 7. They were all... 
Anticipation and anxiety. Y2K has arrived in America. It was 12:01 a.m. and the ball had dropped in New York, and every you know the TVs were still on, and people were checking their microwave ovens, and they're checking their phones. All the phones work. By and large, everything worked. Sure enough, there were no viruses. No planes fell out of the sky. Elevators didn't plummet to the ground. It was nothing but just a big yawner. No major problems to report, not only in the United States, but in fact, throughout the world. Now, the reality is that there were tens of thousands of Y2K problems, but the thing is, you didn't hear about them. It's true. Behind the scenes in Washington, Koskinen's putting out fires all night. The Japanese reported uh, that the computer safety systems monitoring that their nuclear plants wasn't functioning well. The Department of Transportation is saying the low-level wind shear detectors at all the airports in the United States failed. And I sent him a note back saying, "We、well, are kidding, right?" And he said, "No.、Uh, <clears throat> when you landed at LaGuardia, there were no low-level wind shear detectors, and the defense intelligence satellite system has gone down." So I had a conference with the Defense Department, the State Department, and the CIA, and sure enough, it went well. There were things that didn't work, but nothing systemic. One bomb does go off, but it's in Russia when President Boris Yeltsin announces he's stepping down. The Vladimir Putin era begins in the midst of millennium celebrations. Slovo, godo, slovo, nieko. Koskinen's been working two years to prevent a catastrophe in the U.S., but as they say, no good deed goes unpunished. Only took about six hours before the media began to be full of stories saying. Well, that was a hoax. What a waste of money! Things couldn't be going more smoothly. So smoothly, some are even asking if all that preparing was necessary. So at midnight, I took a big cake up to the reporters, and Sam Donaldson of ABC、uh, was there, and he said, "Well, this is all a big waste of time." And I told him, I said, "Sam, you all don't care because nobody died." I said, "If there's not blood in the streets, you think it's not a problem." The public back. Ash against the two faces of Y2K is harsh and immediate. So the guy who wrote the Paul Revere story, I would have loved to have seen him having coffee the next morning, and you know, like everything is okay. Like, how do you live with that? Peter struggled as a result of having been so visibly associated with Y2K, which was a great shame because he did a, a wonderful job and it was very responsible. And basically, I was in a one decade long manic stage.、And And when I came down, I stopped doing media interviews at all. We received death threats. People were upset. The reality is, white tech was an issue. We know it was an issue because we went and tested. Systems failed, and rather than have them fail, we spent money to fix them. Those Y two K fixes cost an estimated four hundred billion dollars worldwide. It was the first time the world came together on a single project. If John Koskinen had not been appointed to that position, I do not believe the U.S. government would have gotten its act together in time. A couple months later, I rented a car from a local company in Raleigh Durham Airport, and I get charged ten dollars for underage driver. And I said, "What's that?" And the guy said, "Oh, that's our Y2K problem. It keeps thinking you were born." <clears throat> in 1839 or in 1939, and it's now 1900. And you're actually minus、uh, 39 years old. And I said, "Where were you guys when I needed you?" <laughs>、uh, surprisingly, over the last year or two, there's a growing realization that we did dodge a bullet, and I think that has been exacerbated by COVID. If we ran Y2K like we were running COVID, we would have failed. Y2K had a single message. If Y2K happened today, you would have everybody cherry picking and getting their information from their own sources. It's not that misinformation is new; it's that it wasn't as easy and it wasn't as prevalent. We truly were that '90s generation. We were the last ones that really kind of remember growing up without technology. From a historic lens, it's a seismic shift, and I think in a hundred years.
be talking about the 90s as the era where everything went, you know, digital and became this whole technological world that we now live in. Kind of crazy. Có lúc muốn biến em với anh là gì? Chỉ là bản thân chơi với nhau không cần gì. Mà sao từng phút giây tình yêu nào có hay cứ đến với ta chẳng thể nào kịp nhận ra. Anh vẫn cứ nhớ nhung đến em hàng ngày. Em là tình yêu hay lẽ sống trên đời này? Nào như là đóa hoa một thiên thần sứ xa khiến cho ta ngất ngây không tìm được lối ra. Chẳng biết đến bao giờ nào đâu có anh ngờ tình yêu đã lỡ trao cho nhau. Người yêu mãi không rời đành. Trong trái tim anh hằng mong ước Muốn nói với em bao điều Dù cho trời đổi thay Em là người anh không thể thiếu Anh sẽ mãi mãi yêu em như vậy Chỉ mong là chúng ta tình yêu sẽ đồng đầy ay, ay. Mỗi lần gặp em trên phố Anh chẳng biết nói gì hơn Em cứ xinh mà không cần phải cố Ai cũng biết em là mai thơm Chẳng cần đau khổ mỗi khi âu sầu Vì em đã có anh ở bên Những kỷ niệm mà vẫn giữ trong đầu Anh luôn đặt nó ở trên Về yêu em hơn tất cả Dẫu cho sau này nắng mưa Anh cũng không bao giờ sợ vất vả Dành cho em em sẽ luôn giữ thừa Bởi những tình yêu ngọt như những sữa trắng Cũng bị đắng như tất cả về đến Em cứ yên tâm không cần lo lắng Hãy subscribe cho kênh Ghiền Mì Gõ Để không bỏ lỡ những video hấp dẫn